I'm Mina Malik Hussain and you're watching The Coffee Table. And today, as always, we have an extravaganza visual delights for you because we are welcoming on the show today two amazing art archivists who are artists in their own rights, who are supremely talented and are also doing incredible work towards preserving the legacy of Pakistani modern art. And I think that um, this is a conversation that we haven't had before on the show. And I'm very excited to find out more about the work that these two wonderful ladies are doing. Today, I'm delighted to welcome virtually on the show, Nujaha Akhlaq, who is a visual artist. She has an MFA in fine art from Goldsmiths College, a BFA in film production from Concordia University, and right now is the guiding light behind the Zahur al Akhlaq archive. And our second guest today is Saira Ansari, who works with the Sharjah Art Foundation in research and publication. She is a recipient of the Lahore Biennale Foundation Research Fellowship that was given, granted to her in 2016 in conjunction with the Asia Art Archive, which is based in Hong Kong, to develop a digital archive on Pakistani modernist Zubeda Agha. She is also the contributing art editor of the South Asian literary journal Paper Cuts. So I'm like surrounded by geniuses today. Hello, ladies, and welcome to the show. Thank you so Hi. much for uh, How are you? welcome. Now, we're just going to sort of get the hang of this sort of virtual overlap here, so it's totally fine. But I'm excited to be having this conversation today, and both of you are so smart. I'm feeling very intimidated, so now you have to do all the talking, and I'm just going to like sit back and listen. <laughs> so let's start. Could you tell me, like, what is an archive? Like, what is that? Because when sort of one thinks of an archive, and then oftentimes you think of like a lot of books and manuscripts and old things and... I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think there are, um, now there are very different um, kind of ways of looking at archives. Traditionally, it's a, a, a method of um, record keeping uh, right. that preserves things from their original kind of uh, in their state so that they can be used later mm. and that you can get, um, you can draw history from them or you can fact check from them or yeah. it's just material that's existing that defines that elements, building elements of something that's happened. So for instance, in an art archive, you could have anything um, apart from the painting that people think that you should be looking at, there's documentation of what was happening behind the scenes. So there's... Mm. Um, photographs of um, galleries or artist studios, which are delightful, or people they were sitting and having chai with and gapshap yeah, and yeah. smoking with, and you're like, oh, achha, inki dosti thi. So yeah. maybe they were talking about work together. Um, there's catalogs, which are quite interesting because then you have all the writers in there, you have um, the sponsors, the patrons, the locations. So everything kind of, um, there's lots of elements. So you have film, uh, yeah. uh, photograph, text, a lot of stuff. And as you said that we think of books a lot, I mean, books are kind of a way of archival material into a written form. Mm -hmm. And how things have changed now is that a lot of the archives are going digital okay. um, in a way to preserve them for longer and mm. also to make them accessible. Um, open access is a problem. They're not right. always free to access. Uh, Why is and that? So they, because there's a lot of copyright laws. Okay. Uh, basically, copyright issues, a lot of press, for instance, would be from different um, newspapers and writers and the amount of work that goes into taking permissions uh, mm. to just open such material is is a lot, is very expensive, it's very time consuming. And sometimes people will be dead and um, or newspapers would have shut down and who do yeah. you reach out for, you know, permissions for. So there's a lot of things that happen. But if you want, you can always access these archives. It might not be available at a click of a button, but mm. if you're researching, you get in touch with any archiving institution, yeah. they'll give you access. And as long as you credit them as the source. Mm. Mm. Which is what I saw on their art archive. I was looking at the website and they were like, we love it when you use our things, but just give us credit, which is, of course, fair enough. So, Noor Jahan, um, tell me about sort of art archiving specifically. Like Saira mentioned, there are copyright issues and then uh, most archives now need to be digitized. So what does that mean for art archives? And how is sort of like that different from like a, a regular, maybe like a literary archive, for example? 
Well, I think every artist's archive would be different because mm -hmm. uh, every artist is different. And so the nature of what they have left behind or collected mm -hmm. or the evidence, as it will, uh, will, will really uh, vary. And I can only speak. I'm no expert on archives. I'm really learning as I go along. And often it's the children or descendants uh, of, of artists who, who end up managing or being the custodian of these mm. things, as, as, mm. as am I. So in uh, the case of Zahur al uh, my father, I think uh, it, 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 I can very much see um, you know the the things that he was interested in from his no, from his uh, library to catalogs of exhibitions and artists that he was collecting uh, to uh, notebooks um, albums. Uh, visual research that he was doing. There's a lot of photography in Zahu's archive. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, a lot of documents from the National College of Arts where he taught for a period of over 30 years. So, and he wasn't somebody that I, I think particularly collected a lot of material, but mm -hmm. you know, there's evidence to, to, to the contrary. I think going back to your question, yes, every artist's archive will be uh, quite unique and different depending on, on the artists themselves. So Saira, since you work with the Sharjah Art Foundation, um, I imagine that the sort of role of a foundation such as that one, and of course that they also, I think, work on the Sharjah Biennale as well, which is like this, one of the big ones. So the foundation is also um, working on collecting and preserving and archiving material, right? Um, well, it depends. The foundation mm -hmm. has many, many different right. roles that it kind of um, uh, you know, uh, 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 operates in different capacities as a mm -hmm. nonprofit and an institution that is catering to the region. Right. Um, I am connected more to the bookmaking side where I'm putting yeah. together, I'm working with editors and writers towards putting books. Um, there is a certain level of archiving that's happening with the collections uh, side okay. of the foundation. Uh -huh. um, it's not of there are certain artists that they do collect archives of, but I don't work directly with that. Right. And as I mean, as um, Noor Jahan said, I also want to say I have not been trained as an archivist other than when I did get the fellowship, I was able to get a bit of training with the yeah. Asia Art Archive um, organization. But I am not, uh, I, I am not legally an artist. <laughs> <historian, no. laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that's what I'm curious about, as to sort of, do you need to be trained to be an archivist? Does it sort of require certain skills that one can learn or should learn or ends up learning along the way? Uh, any kind of special specialization would be very important in Pakistan. A lot mm -hmm. of... Uh, um, education around art is either uh, studio art or pedagogy. So you're either teaching okay. it or you're making it. Right. Um, and I think it's very important that we begin to focus more on art history, train mm. more historians, uh, more researchers. Um, preservation is a massive, massive issue that all of us face who are either working with archives or who have families mm. who are artists or with estates. Um, there, you know, we have to reach out to people across the border mm -hmm. or yes. in different countries for look for actually properly trained people who will be uh, doing concept, you know conserving uh, conservation work or archival yes. work so it's mm. uh, i think we need to pan out in what art education actually is in the country so nujaha as somebody who does have a background in uh, teaching as well and here in pakistan i think that the point that saira makes about art history is a really important one and do you see it sort of being is it part of art curriculums in art schools art history is there a sort of sense that this is also an aspect of art training that students should have that's an excellent question, and I think, unfortunately, it's severely lacking in the art curriculum. You know, you look at, uh, uh, you know, art institutions here, and yes, everybody wants to be an artist, um, but and there's a few people, very few people, a, ha a handful or less even, who do art criticism or writing yes. on art, but mm. there's no... There is a, a real lack of the discipline of art history. Mm. And uh, for example, when I began teaching here in 2014, uh, without having an art history background per se, um, I was asked, oh, could you teach art history? Nobody wants to teach art, teach art history. So I created a <laughs> course called which is Cinema like, yeah, and Art History. Yeah, take this course. Nobody wants. <laughs> well, I mean, so like... Uh, here, take this course and work your way. You can edit that out if you want. Yes. <laughs> but uh, 
I, I, my compromise was to was to create a course called Overlapping Narrative Cinema and Art History because Ooh. I wanted to uh, talk about film. And so it, mm. it was a way of showing films and entering the, maybe not covering the art history of a region, but uh, talking about ideas and concepts in art history, which mm. is useful for students who are studying art and going to be practitioners. So yes, I mean, the, the answer to your question is it is it is a discipline that really uh, needs uh, to be a mo much more part of the curriculum. And uh, because we have such a rich uh, history of art and culture, mm. not just within that in the time of Pakistan, but of South Asia, and I think it should be much more integrated because the country is only, you know, uh, it's less than a century old and our art and our history and our traditions are ancient. I'm really interested in art, in art history because, uh, as you said, our history and our traditions and our, and our sort of artistic imagination is an ancient one. And I feel like that's where art history and the archive becomes linked there because in order to kind of really own our identity as Pakistani artists, we need to know where we're coming from. And I think that there's a certain kind of nervousness about acknowledging that we are a part of a South Asian kind of a creative imagination. And like you said, Noor Jahan, you know, we're a very baby country right now, but you know, we go back a long way. And it's a sort of strange, con it's a sort of, it's a contradiction, but it's also something where I feel it's like a great deal of space for, for growth and documentation as well. Um, uh, no, I think you're absolutely right. And there's there's a, a long way to go. Again, I'm not an art historian. I'm kind of, again, in this position of being a custodian yeah. of my mm. of my father's uh, state and archive. And, uh, but, but I think the more I kind of, um, uh, you know, was, was creating the course and uh, the, the more I kind of looked you know, actually had an engagement more through art history through my father's work because he's very engaged with yeah. the history of art, of Western right. art, mm -hmm. and own tradition, and also making linkages between uh, Chinese and Japanese um, aesthetics. So Ooh, it, it kind of, you know, if you want to bring that into it, he it, it, it's it's a very interesting dialogue that he's forming as a painter between uh, what he sees as aesthetic languages of Orient and Occident. And I think that at that time, sort of when modernism was really kind of uh, gearing up, it was this um, really interesting, um, a lot of interesting ideas, like you said, the sort of marriage between the Orient and the Occident sort of coming together. And you see this, and for example, like Ezra Pound was fascinated with Japanese, for example. And I find that really interesting because both of you, Saira and Noor Jahan, are archiving the works of two artists who kind of defy categorization in many really fascinating ways. So sort of, you know, before we go to a break very quickly, so um, Saira, how did you come to Zubeda Agha's archive? Like, how did, you, how did you find her? What connects you to her specifically? Uh, there's, uh, there's two different things at how and then why. Yes. I think how was much more easier because I do, I do have a family relationship. Hmm. She is my nani sister. Right. I have grown up around, um, you know, kind of her artwork and conversations around her. And it was much later that I realized how important she was. Hmm. Um, and, and it's very important. Art history is very important. And what Nurjaha mentions is it's very, very pertinent to why I started working on Zubeda Aga and later the archives. It's because, um, as you said, our history forms the identity of our nation, but it's it's taught in such a it's fraught way. It's really problematic. Mm -hmm. So when we do art history at NC, or I, I don't know, things must have changed. I was at NC 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> 2001 was when I started. Um, we, we do ancient history. We start mm -hmm. with Indus Valley civilization, right. go all the way to Napoleon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're coming down to um, Napoleon, Alexander and everything, and then going down to the Mughals, mm. and now we're talking about miniature, and then suddenly, it kind of our world disappears, and we're now studying Western art history, and we're doing mm. everything from Picasso to all the way to Jackson Pollock, mm. and it just makes you think, what was happening in Pakistan, modern Pakistan, yes. post 1947? Mm. So we had one class where a few of the names are listed, ke bhai ye Sadiq Ain tha, ye mm. Shamza tha, or ye Ahmed Parvez tha, and khatam. I yeah. never heard Sabeda Agha's name ever, um, mm, and that's it true, was actually. only in mm. uh, much. 
Yeah, and it was very problematic. And I didn't realize she was that important because I never got to study her until I joined the master's program. And my my Dr. Atika, who was kind of uh, giving us a lecture at that point on something, sat me down and said, "If if it's missing, why is it missing? You need to question that." She yeah. was very very important. Yeah. Um, and that is literally about two thousand late two thousand. Mid two thousand to late two thousands, the kind of interest started, mm-hmm. and one of my mentors who's passed away, Lala Rukh, was somebody yes. who also really, really pushed me. Um, and so the how and why kind of mixed together between the the, the lack of art history kind of working towards her and my access to her. Yeah, I think that is so fascinating, and I want to talk more about both the archives. But we're going to take a very quick break. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back to the coffee table. We're talking about art history and art archives with the inimitable Noor Jahan Clark and Saira Ansari. So, Saira, before the break, we were talking about how you came to Zubaydah Agha's work, and a great, a, a sort of a one great sort of motivator for that was the fact that she's kind of been erased from Pakistani art history for, I'm sure, a variety of reasons. But it's it's really odd because she was a massive part of the art scene in Pakistan during that sort of era. So tell me more about Zubaydah. Because again, like I said, she really does defy one category. Like to say that she was a lady painter, I think really diminishes the impact of what she did and all the different kinds of things that she did for the Pakistan art scene. Absolutely. I think what's happened is that she may have, she's disappeared from maybe the public memory. Uh, mm. However, uh, if you speak to art historians or, uh, you know, older generation of artists or even those who were around um, in the art milieu around the late 70s or even the 80s would mm. remember her very yes. much. So um, I, I, w- I quickly wanted to quote something. So Eftikhar Dadi is an art historian yes. who, uh, who teaches at Cornell in, in the U.S. as he's mm. one of the few voices who have been looking at art history in Pakistan and South Asia. Asia and um, Muslim South Asia very academically, which mm. is which is why his name springs up every time. And he had written something which I think articulates it very mm. clearly. Mm. He's wrote, um, and I'm quoting from his book, since Aha never joined a teaching institution, left mm. no public writings, and due to barriers of gender and class, remained isolated from circles of critics and artists, she had virtually no important critical interlocutor among the literary intelligentsia. And I think that's, that kind of sums up why she was forgotten. There was no one championing her, no one writing about her. She was mm. leaving behind no students, um, no prodigies. You know, it's a, a lot of these things kind of play into uh, how history is written in Pakistan yeah. because a mm. lot of the artists that you know of um, were associated with art institutions in Pakistan, whether it was, um, or, you know, whether it was the... Uh, fine art societies or the art galleries or NCA. Mm. Um, And I think that was one of the reasons that, and she was a hermit. She never (laughs) got married. Mm. She didn't care much for people. (laughs) She didn't didn't give two hoots about what anyone said or did. (laughs) She lived in Islamabad. (laughs) She was far away from... (laughs) I mean, but I mean, I mean, considering that she was such a, you know, she, she, such a, mysterious figure who did not have a very public appearance per se as an artist, as an yeah. institution builder. She was very, very important. Um, yes. She set Massive. up the first art mm. gallery of the country. Ah. Um, and she was in, you know, she was in the committee which set up that first national art museum of the country. She set up the collection. Um, she was traveling the world, taking Pakistani shows abroad. She was making East and West Pakistan connections, which was super important, which I have to, you know, kind of mention here that one of the things that's been erased from our history is our connection with Bangladesh when it was East Pakistan yes. for 24 years. Mm. And, and that's not, and a, that's not a significant amount of time. Mm. It's massive. It's yeah. massive kind of conversations that were happening. I mean, some of the most famous artists and in Pakistan, people will recognize uh, Bengali painters like Zainul Abedin, but maybe not mm. the other names. Mm. Um, mm. However, at the time that Zabed Agha was running her gallery from 1961 to 77, which is about 16 years, yeah. a lot of the work was coming from East Pakistan and these connections were being maintained, which were just kind of chopped. Um, hmm. post the, you know, the war kind of the divide. Hmm. Um, hmm. So I think what the what the archive was helping me do was not look at it as a painter. As I said, a lot of people in the art historical kind of sphere, the small bubble that it is, did know about her practice as an artist. It was yes. very important for me to look at her as a person, as a hmm. patron, hmm. as an institution hmm. builder, as a gallerist. And I think that's incredibly exciting for me. 
it is, it is sounds really exciting though. So Nurjaha, tell me about your story. Now, of course, Zuhul is your father, so you have access to a lot of that material. But sort of at what point did you sort of decide that now this needs to be properly documented and collated and put together? Well, I had been managing the estate of Zahur Laklak, which is a bit more the commercial side of things, dealing with galleries, curators, art historians, mm-hmm. researchers, researchers, PhD students yeah. for uh, a number of years. And then uh, when I moved back to Pakistan in 2014, I realized there was a lot of boxes of papers and material. Mm-hmm. And started, um, you know, with just in terms of like having organizational material to hand out to people who were interested in, in access, accessing him, um, you know, just you know, working with an intern over the summer, starting to digitize material. But I realized there's, it's, you know, there's a, a lot of material. I need mm. help doing it. Yeah. So I've been kind of been away at it, you know, over the, you know, usually during the summer months, I have an intern or I'm doing things myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of been a bit like this but then recently I were I got I applied for a Canada Council grant and was yeah. uh, very very pleased to to receive it uh, so that I could further kind of refine my training and skills regarding archives and you you um, mentioned Asia Art Archive which uh, you know I applied for this grant before the pandemic in last fall and so by the time I knew that I would I got the grant it was basically uh, you know not safe to travel mm. so basically I've been in uh, or through video chat and we're going to do a few training sessions. I hmm. was really looking forward to going home, but you know, it's not, not possible just now. So uh, I ho- I'm hoping to get, you know, the, the, the method- methodological training and the technical right. training so that I can see it huh. because it's a too big task for one person. And hopefully I can, you know, get a, a, a small team, maybe two or three people to, to help me do it. It's going to take a, a number of years, hmm. I imagine. And um, you know, there's with, with somebody like Zahula Clark, there's, uh, you know, so many different kinds of material, you know, maybe uh, paintbrushes he collected on a trip to China or, you know, strange little odds and ends of things that he was fascinated with. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he used to scratch his works on paper and canvases, you know, incorporated into his te- technique. So there's all kinds of like odd, strange things, but, yeah. um, you know, it's it's all kind of part of an entity besides the you know, material like uh, correspondence, um, uh, documentation of his work, uh, visual research, all of that. So it's it's kind of like a mixed bag. Yeah. And what is is that there's probably also an incredible amount of like sort of resources that are required to create an archive also. Like, you know, do you need special scanners or special kinds of storage facilities where you sort of can put material, you know, for example, like an acid proof box or things like that. I'm sorry if this sounds very basic, but you know, I'm learning as we go. <laughs> I'm I am also on on that learning curve and it's, you know, everything in, let's say in a place like Pakistan, we have a tremendous amount of dust and humidity. Mm, and these yes. are things that are, that are really uh, the enemy of anything archival, whether it's paper or film or, uh, you know, th- these things are not, these, these. this is really the enemy of, of archiving. And, um, you know, I still have a lot to learn. I mean, beginning with, you should just wear, you know, cotton gloves when you're, mm. when you're handling sensitive. Mm. Um, I'm still learning as well. And part of it is it's, it's a, it's like a library science. It is actually a discipline. I am again, not an archivist. I'm an <laughs> artist and I'm just my head around all of these, all of these kind of uh, new things. You, there are some really great scanners out there that mm-hmm. are in the mm-hmm. prosumer category. So they're not extremely high end, but you know, one could make use of those. And the other thing to do is just, uh, photograph things, but it's okay. not just uh, I mean, you would use this to digitize the material, but then the other task is the kind of database and how you then in mm. a technological database scan yeah. things. I think Syra can speak more of this because she's actually had the training at yeah. AAA and I think she's uh, more knowledgeable than I am currently about it. <laughs> but I'm also curious here at this juncture is that, um, is there kind of particularly kind of Pakistani approach to art history? And we've kind of sort of skirted around it but Noor Jahan, I remember you and I were having a conversation about this and you mentioned how a lot of, a lot of the um, information or the history that we have around a lot of artists is anecdotal. And there's a, it's a lot of oral history in a way and there's a lot of mythologization of it that, oh, you know, I was at the NCA at the same time as X and this is what I saw. So it's all very kind of fluid. No one's really put things down 
And it's kind of difficult to kind of sift, I imagine, what is truth and what is merely just anecdote. Do you think that also has a, has a role to play in archiving? Well, the two are definitely connected because one of the things we rely on even in academia or writing art history are testimonies. And right. so where do you get your information from is mm. anecdotes and, you know, people who knew the subject that you are writing about. Uh, if the Kardadi is absolutely uh, the, the, the person that I, Saira mentioned, I mean, he's written a pioneering book on Pakistani art history. And, uh, you know, there's just, it's still a field that needs a kind of rigor. And, you know, there, there are some, you know, very few uh, people who are doing their PhDs on, on Pakistani history, art history. I think it's going to increase in the coming years. I hope mm. it's going to, to mm. increase. But absolutely, I think there is this, you know, we always, uh, even if you speak to, uh, if, I, if I'm if i interviewing one of, uh, uh, you know, my father's students, it's always like, you know, and, and oral history is part of our tradition as well. I wouldn't okay. discount it, hmm, but hmm. It's kind of balanced marriage of both things. But yeah. I think we, we desperately written or written uh, you know art history or films or you know any kind of media one can right. one can huh. uh, utilize so everything um, but i think there has to be there i think there has to be a bit of both it can't be just one thing or the other and yeah. uh, and i think actually we have a very rich history of uh, oral tradition so we shouldn't dismiss it but it can't be all kind of hmm. stories you know it, right. it, it needs right. it needs to evolve into a decision with, uh, with uh, analysis and hmm. with, uh, you know, a kind of a kind of uh, substance. Yeah, kind of be like a cog in the machine. So, Saira, you are working on Zubaydah Agha's whose, whose own work, it's been several decades now since she passed on. Do you feel sometimes like your archiving work is also a race against time? Because there might be material that's kind of falling apart now, you know, newspaper clippings that sort of molder, you know, like Nurjaha said, Things that in Pakistan, we have a lot of dust, there's a lot of, you know, climate difficulties and challenges. There's also the sense that we don't know that these things are as important as they are. I mean, so um, one of the things that Nurjaha said is, is also very important to make that distinction. Archiving yeah. is, is, is a science, but there's also a new developing kind of um, a field, which is artist as archiver, which I think okay. is kind of the broader lines along which I would think Nurjaha and I both operate, which is us accessing, um, you know, histories for uh, kind of... Uh, mostly as an artistic gesture as well. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the resources to build um, institutions and centers and, yeah. you know, temperature control and humidity control, all of those things. Mm. These are things, this is always going to be a race against time. Um, I think a lot of this, uh, the material that I have is much, much older. And I am working very specifically for material that I have taken out of her house in Islamabad. So right. I'm not just looking at archives from everywhere. Hmm. So they have been in some, They have. there's obviously a bit of aging and decay, but they're still kind of there. Yeah. I think it's getting it more and more exciting for me, the more that I'm able to dig through and get out things. So I don't feel rushed for time one okay, i think good. it's great uh i remember the initial fellowship that i had gotten was for six months and it took me two years because the amount of permissions i had to take the amount of files that i had to open the amount of mm. trips that i had to take it took so long i had no idea oh my but god i would it's like to mention here. i know we Hi, Allah Maaf. It was, it was really, really a lot. It was very, um, it, it was very taxing financially, emotionally, physically, everything. I had a full-time job. I was trying to, you know, it was very, very difficult. I was, I live in a different country, yeah. but I do have to mention here that, you know, yeah. we talk about Asia Art Archive and absolutely they were imperative in teaching me, but I must, must mention the Citizens Archive of Pakistan here who have been instrumental mm. in helping this archive to be documented because they have received their training from Asia Art Archive Hong Kong as well. They have and they have a setup there for documentation. There's special cameras, special scanners that have been donated. I spent about 14 days, no, I don't know, it was about 10 days or so, mm. about eight hours a day working with two assistants at the Citizens Archive uh, office in Karachi. And we scanned everything. And I, I am so glad that such a facility exists in Pakistan. Yes, I'm also really glad. Yay! <laughs> We're going to take a very quick break and come back to this wonderful conversation. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back to the coffee table. We're talking to Saira and Sari and Noor Jahan Akhlaq, hotshot archivists of two amazing Pakistani artists. <laughs> I just called you hotshots on my own court. 
<laughs> so, Saira, I want to talk a little bit more about Zubaida Agha and the institution building that she was doing. Because again, to me, an archive means history and history. It, this is all of these things that she was doing and her sort of contributions to the institutions that have carried on art in Pakistan have been tremendous. Sort of beginning from the National Art Gallery that she, you know, camp, you know, worked so hard to set up. And to, it took its time. <laughs> it took a while to sort of come into existence. But she was also doing all sorts of really fascinating things. So tell me more. So, the, I mean, the contemporary art galleries is what she kind of uh, operated for about 16 years. And then she started working on the National Art Gallery. Yeah. There was a lot of work put in. So she traveled to museums in the U.S. and Japan. She was looking at everything. She was looking at how libraries are set up, how um, artwork is stored, how thing is, how inventory is made, how guests, you know, how you engage with audiences, how mm -hmm. programs are developed. A lot of those things she'd been trying to do at the gallery itself. And the gallery had... Um, it's estimated that they put over 200 exhibitions at wow. the gallery before National Art Gallery. So just mm, like talking about yeah. the uh, Raul Pindi Art Gallery. Um, and so she's kind of working on the whole setup for the National Art Gallery, which is in Islamabad, which is an institution now, which is the country's own, you know, own um, collection. Um, but what happened was, you know, the, the National Art Gallery opened exactly 10 years after she passed away. Mm. She died in 97 and that opened in 2007. Yes. Lots of bureaucratic delays, so many issues. And it's really sad that she missed uh, to see what happened because she was so instrumental. She was part of the executive committee that was setting it up. She was writing all the kind of the structure for it, how to run it. She, she donated a large part of her own collection, which mm. is now Pakistan's... Um, which kind of made the core of Pakistan's first, uh, you know, the nation's art collection. So Sadiqan had donated about 200 of his own works. Wow. Um, Zubaida Agha had donated a lot of her works mm -hmm. and including the collection of the gallery. Um, but sadly, when you go to National Art Gallery, you won't be able to find this information. You know, she was important. Mm -hmm. There's a section, don uh, you know, kind of dedicated to her, but she's missing from their history, from the building, from what something she set up. Um, and I think that's very important for the archive to address, uh, to kind of, uh, as you guys were saying, oral histories. This is my problem with Pakistani art history. We rely so much on oral histories that yeah. a lot of fact checking, a lot of information drops through the loops because there are very few people telling these stories. That's right, what right. we have to consider. If there were many, many other voices telling these stories, we might be able to know more. Um, and, and that is the hope for the archive to address. Yeah. And kind of bring this bad, oh, I was going to say badass, you can totally edit that. Uh, <laughs> bring this incredible woman back into the limelight. I mean, she didn't care for the spotlight, but I really think she deserves all the attention that can be given to her. Absolutely. And do you think that part of this kind of uh, reclusiveness also has to do with the fact that Aga's own practice was very cutting edge for the time? And her first show kind of received these mixed reviews because it was so different and people hadn't really seen things like that. And it was very modernist. And people were just like, why, where are the trees, you know? Why is it not a landscape? This woman has sort of come onto the scene and it's just like, boom. You think that she was just, people didn't understand yeah, so her I work? Think her first show kind of, her, her first show really did kind of uh, was uh, shocked a lot of the audiences yeah. and there was a there was quite a raging debate in the press for about two months. Um, yeah. It's quite nice. <laughs> part of the archives is coming across those press articles saying this is absolute nonsense. What is this? This is not art. Um, it's kind of slated to be the first modern exhibition modern art exhibition in Pakistan, her solo exhibition, which, which was in 1949 in Karachi. Huh. And at this which point, I want very, to very interrupt. Big. It was the first. Huh. And I want to interrupt you here because yeah. I also want to sort of say that Aga was trained by an Italian, Mario Perlinghier, who apparently was taught by Picasso. Um, so, um, and then she went to Paris to study she art. Well, so there's a lot of things. Actually, yeah. first she started with B.C. Sanyal, who was a, yeah. a very important artist at his time, who was connected to the Mayo School of Arts, which is now called NCA. Yeah. And he had uh, left Mayo School of Arts and set up his own studio where a lot of people went. And she had been introduced by her brother to B.C. Sanyal. Um, and that's where she studied. She learned how to paint there. She learned the techniques um, mm. in painting and drawing. 
But then her brother introduced her to Mario Carlingeri, who was an Italian prisoner of war, who was living in Walton and was commissioned on a design project. <laughs> um, and that apparently he was a student of Picasso. Yep. So all of these snippets have been kind of picked up from here and there, from press articles from the 40s, mm. from a photograph that I shared with you by email with his little note at the back. He's standing yes. in their house wishing her luck. But I mean, we don't have any more information. I'm desperate to find out more about who he is, hmm. what he did, why was he there? How was he Picasso student? I know, like, so how? what's very what important is that he home? kind of made her. I know, Italian prisoner war and horror, of course, makes so much sense. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> but um, what he told her was that he wanted her to think outside the box. He mm. wanted her to paint ideas. And yeah. this is primarily what she became really well known for, that she was an abstract painter who was looking at these, you know, kind of non-tangible concepts. And then and, and she got a scholarship. She went to London. Um, she went to St. Martin's for about, about half a year. Between 50 and 51, she was there. She had an exhibition there in London, a solo exhibition. Um, and then she went to Paris to Ecole des Beaux-Arts and oh, the studied art like there. At and this is at you know, top-notch places. And then she comes back home and shows and tea and everyone is just sort of flabbergasted at this sort of avant-garde amazingness. So it's just blowing my mind on so many levels. <laughs> but what I also really, um, I think that this kind of avant-garde thinking outside of the box spirit is also what, is also part of Zahur Lakhlaq's own legacy as well, no Jaha. Isn't that so? He did he did so many different kinds of things. There's, you know, there was just so much curiosity about form and about different ways of saying things that you can see in the work. Absolutely. And I think um, his his training when he was a student at, at the time, it was also called the Mayo, uh, the Mayo College of Arts, mm. the Mayo School of Arts. He uh, was trained in a very kind of uh, international modernism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, his, his teacher was Shakir Ali, another important Pakistani modernist. Yes. And he kind of broke away from that uh, gradually. Uh, he went on to do postgraduate studies in London, first at the Hornsey College of Art and then at the Royal College of Art in the mm -hmm. late 60s. Mm -hmm. And right the time in you know that when Europe and and the world was kind of like having these incredible student protests and they were students were shutting the world down yeah and so he had that uh, experience in London in studying printmaking mm. so he was trained as a painter studied printmaking and then in the returned back to Pakistan and was uh, teaching as, as a lecturer at, at, the, at the National College and then he started experimenting with sculpture mm. in the 70s graphic there are a number of um, uh, commissions for hotels, um, you know, interiors, all of these kind of things are, mm -hmm. the, are there in the archive. Architectural uh, monuments, um, there's two sculptures in, uh, there's the, the Crescent and Star sculpture outside of Islamabad. Yeah. There's, 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 there's a kind of restless experimentation, which mm -hmm. I would say is mm -hmm. very practice from that's very consistent and the, and and he's being a very uh an artist of a cerebral nature he's always pushing himself and yeah. pushing the possibilities of form of material of uh, of his own kind of um very kind of cerebral cerebral investigations Quite and right. he's very much mm -hmm. engaged in the history of um of uh, islamic architecture of iconography mm -hmm. and there's there's a of research into the kind of artistic traditions of the subcontinent and not only limited to art history but I would say uh, he also is really interested in crafts and working with with uh, what you would call smaller craft craftsmen karigars and yeah, you know yeah, uh, experiment yeah. with, with one and so also, I think it's huh, a, I just want to sort of huh yes. and I also want to just at this juncture um, quickly talk about the film that you are planning around your archive work. And I think that's a really interesting kind of cross-genre uh, combination of your own diverse interests and bringing that to the work you're doing with the archive. And that sounds really exciting. Thank you. I hope it has the chance to come to fruition because, of course, in the in, in the COVID world, uh, you know, things are very uncertain and a film is something that definitely relies on funding and uh, crew. So, uh, but the exciting thing is that uh, absolutely, as you said, I, I, I've been struggling with my own practice with the demands of the estate, the archive and kind of juggling the things. And I think because of the visual nature of Zahu's archive, you know, there's so many uh, images. And no. when I first started sifting, 
I was like, you know, the, the film was already kind of forming in my head. Mm. I was kind of having strange dialogue, if you will, with this kind of material. Wow. I was 19 years old when he died and he was very supportive of my interest in film, which is what I went uh, then to, on to study. So it kind of like, you know, was, was something that started in my head. And then I uh, decided to apply for this grant. And at least it's going to help me to archive uh, the, the materials. I've mm -hmm. conducted a number of interviews with people in Pakistan, his peers, his students, yeah. uh, some friends. It's it's kind of building. It's it's uh, it's kind of, you know, it's still in process. I don't want to speak too much about it. But I think the other <laughs> yeah, thing... Yeah, let's is, just sort of keep it, you know. <laughs> but... Um, the wonderful work that both of you have been doing and this labor of love, really. And I think that it is so tremendous because this is by preserving our, histor our history, our artistic history, um, these archives are creating, are preserving stories, are preserving the past for students now and for students to, and even for people who are just interested, like me, for example, to sort of connect with our past, to connect with all these brilliant inventive minds that were sort of combining this really global outlook with a really Pakistani voice and a Pakistani identity. And I think that moving forward, this is something that's really inspiring for everybody. You know, I, won't, I won't just say young people, but everybody. But thank you so much, Saira and Nujiha, for being on the show. Good luck in all your wonderful works. Thank you guys for watching. If you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. And we will see you next time on The Coffee Table. Bye now.